Uh, Coach John Castor here with Life Inspired. I've got a very special guest on this episode. His name is Hejma Gadimi, and he's actually a Northern Virginia native. So I know him, and I've not only been following his brand and what he's been working on for the past couple of years and building up Secret Honorage, which we're going to dig into a bit, uh, but I'm actually connected to him through one of my fraternity brothers. So that's how I first heard about his brand. And uh, he's got some really interesting perspectives, some really cool story that I can't wait to share both personally and professionally. So it doesn't matter if you are coming from, you know, wanting motivation, inspiration, and how to be successful with your health and fitness, or if you're inspiring, aspiring or inspired entrepreneur, this is gonna be a huge benefit to you. So I wanna welcome Pejman, and Pejman, we're gonna go by PJ during the interview today, correct? Yes, sir. Excited to be here, my friends. So whatever I can do to help your audience, I'm glad to be of assistance. Cool, man. I'm sure everything you're going to share, they're going to be able to take away and apply to their lives, but also walk away with some inspiration, which is where I want to start. So you uh, came to Northern Virginia when you were coming into middle high school, correct? Uh, yeah, it was actually my sophomore year in high school that I ended up in Centerville High in Northern Virginia. So. Cool. Yep. Didn't like it much. I was never very good uh, whatsoever when it came to uh, school, when it comes to like high school or even college or anything. I just sucked at school altogether. But, you know, you're forced to go to high school, so you got to do what you got to do. Yep. No worries. So you were, let's backtrack a little bit more than that into your personal life. You were born in Tehran, correct? Mm -hmm. And that was during the revolution, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a really rough time. And uh, we actually, uh, my mom worked for the... Uh, government you know at the time uh and she did quite a lot for like a company similar to uh what you guys have here in the u.s called lockheed martin or something like that uh like a contractor you know the government and so when the revolution happened anyone who was working for that government at the time was pretty much either needed to leave or they were going to get executed or you know prosecuted one way or another and so we fleed over to france and from france uh spent about 12 years or so uh, in the outskirts of Paris, where she built a, a, a two-store business, which was similar to Kinko's Digital Imaging. And then from there, just left it all behind one more time for a chance at coming to the United States, where we ended up in California for a very brief time of two years, where, again, we were met with more adversity there, and finally landed in Virginia in a basement during my sophomore year. So, Wow. The journey. It is what it is, right? <laughs> and... I'm jumping ahead in my, in my list of questions I have for you, but I'd imagine what you just shared is a large driver and maybe even your deep purpose and why behind what you do, or it was at some point. So yes and no, you know, like I think my why is more, is more the byproduct of that to a degree. Like I realized that these struggles we've overcome, the journey we've gone through had to have a greater meaning than just making money in life. And so I've always, I think from a very young age, been very alert and aware of that. And so I've always been seeking kind of answers in the realm of why am I here? Why did I overcome such adversities? Was it just for a chance to make money in America or was there something greater, you know, associated with that? And so I've always been willing to kind of extend myself and seek out the, the risks and look for different reasons why my why could manifest itself, if that makes sense. And so I think that I've been able to really push the boundary knowing that all these adversities that we've overcome had to have been for a specific reason, even if at the time anyways, when I was younger, I had certainly not found my why by any means. What do you believe that is at this point? Uh, I, I'm a big believer that everything that I've done in my life always leads back to me being a teacher more than anything else. Like yeah, people call me an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. Inc. Magazine said I was one of the most aspiring entrepreneurs to look out for in 2017. And I still don't find myself to adapt to that name of uh, that title of being an entrepreneur. I've built a lot of businesses and I've had a lot of business success and I have had a lot of entrepreneurial success, but I still consider myself a teacher because I've always said that the one key thing that, has, that is in common between all of my leadership background as well as all of my uh, corporate America background and anything else related to business entrepreneurship has always been teaching. And you got quite, I don't want to even call it a resume, but uh, a journey. I, I know I've dug into it a little bit. So everything from working as a telemarketer before you were legally supposed to, 
to leading that same company uh, to getting into real estate, having a career before that while well, in college and maybe even high school, if, if I'm correct, at a bank. Um, so I'd love to hear about that. Why don't you go ahead and share with all of our listeners uh, some bullet points in your timeline professionally before you were full on entrepreneur. So, and I mean, to make it kind of, because it's a long story, but you know, I, I, I was an immigrant, so I didn't have a green card when I first came here. And I, I struggled a lot with the idea of not being able to even find work, not even at McDonald's, you know, something that I would have dreamed of at that time. And, you know, working as a telemarketer, yes, I did kind of really adapt to the idea that it was my only job. I had no choice. I had to be good at it, you know? So one of the things that, that happened is I really focused on, on, on the work, you know, on the selling and just becoming really good at it. Made a name for myself in sales and telemarketing in that same company. And by the age of 18, I was head of that same company as the key uh, and head of all the offices that were in Northern Virginia and Maryland. Now, by 18, that was really good. You know, I was really excited and it was really an awesome time for me. But I decided, I said, you know what? Like, there's got to, this is the ceiling. I'm already at the top of this company. It's a small company. Uh, I can't really go further. And while I had a very comfortable salary, you know, I was almost making 80K a year at the age of 18 without a college degree. I hadn't, I hadn't even gone to college yet. What year was this? Like two uh, this was in, two, well, it was 1999 19, and 2000 because I graduated in 2000. So right before I graduated high school, I decided, I said, well, I got to do something because I have to go to college and I got to kind of figure this out. And I hated academics, meaning I hated school in every way possible. Like I, I was a C student. I wasn't very good. And I just didn't see the purpose of sitting there and learning shit that I didn't need. I didn't care about chemistry and yet I was very good at it. I didn't care about, you know, geometry or any of that crap. And I was very good at it. So I just didn't understand like it and I, I never applied myself. I didn't do good in testing. And so I just didn't like it. And so going to college was a pain, you know, and I was already making good money. I had nice cars already. I owned my own, my first house already in Centerville. So things were good. You know, I was like, I'm 18. Most people wish they were in my position when they get out of college. And so I was like, I got to really make it count and I got to do something. So I went to college just as general studies. I took two semesters at Northern Virginia Community College right there uh, in Annandale. And I was dreading it, man. I was dreading it. And it was really coming into my schedule because I was working a lot of hours at that place. And so I decided I need to either get a better job because I had already hit the ceiling or I need to go to school full time. You know, I got to figure out what I want to do. So I'm kind of like roaming between all these things. And I decided I had a friend, my mom knew a friend that was in banking. She was a bank manager. And uh, she says, you know, you should come to banking. And I'm like, obviously, banking is not going to pay me 80K a year to go and be a teller or something like that. You know, and she's like, well, you have experience. Why don't you come work in sales? And I said, what does sales pay? And she's like, 30K. I'm like, I'm not going to go from 80 to 30. That's not going to make any sense. So she's like, well, the only way you're going to make your salary is if you become a manager. And I'm like, you a manager? Like, can I be a bank manager? And she's like, I don't think someone's going to hire you as a bank manager. You're 18 without a degree. And you have some experience, but I don't think it's going to work. But she said, you know what? They might have a manager trainee program. You can come here and, and you know, try to apply for it. So she put in the good word. And people thought it was funny that an 18-year-old would apply for a bank manager position, but long story short, I go to my interview and I make the guy literally shit himself. Like with, you know, the, the sales structure of my interview, he tells me, I go, it was one of these supermarket banks. I know you're from Northern Virginia, so I'm sure you've seen inside the giants, you know, the banks. Yep. So this was over in Reston, uh, near Reston town center. There was a giant there and there was an actual, uh, there was an actual giant in it. And that's where I went for my interview. And I was told that I would probably be working within a supermarket bank because it was very sales driven, you know? So, and I had a lot of sales experience. So I said, okay, that's fine. Bank is a bank, right? If I have my title and I work in a bank, that's a good transition step. So I went and I really blew him away by actually getting clients for the bank by walking the aisles of the supermarket during my interview without being asked to. So just showing him that without knowing the product or anything, I could do more than his team of five people sitting there behind a desk in less than 30 minutes. So he got really excited. He became my greatest advocate and that led me into the manager training program at the age of 18, which made me one of the youngest bank managers in the United States at the time. What so, would you say for, for people listening to this, what was it that in your mind that allowed you to, to just go and do that? Because Well, I, I think, you know, when we look at jobs, first off, the, the first problem people have is they look at jobs as an obligation. They look at a job as like, I have to get a job. I have to work there. And hopefully the right job I want is 10 years later. They don't look at the job they're getting today as a serious pathway to their career. I mean, look, look at this as the simplest manner. If you're a cashier, right? 
like it's a mindset thing. You, you talk about mindset being important on this podcast. So I'll try to break it down in a very simple manner for you guys. If you go to, and you're a cashier at a store, right? You walk into the store and day one, you say, this is not my job. This is not my company. I don't give a shit. I'm just going to leave in six months anyways. This is a transition job. How good will your effort be knowing that you don't even care about the outcome or the future, right? You're there because you're forced to be there. The question though remains, who forced you to be there but yourself to begin with? But let alone now you're there, you don't even accept the place as a legitimate place to work. How good of a job are you going to do, right? Like nothing. You're going to shit on it. It's going to be the worst experience. And you're most likely going to get either a can or you're going to quit or doing something, right? If you go in there, however, saying, hey, you know what? Right now, right this moment, this is the only job I have. And while it may not be the most extraordinary job I want in the world, if I do a great job, within six months, I could get promoted. Within a year, I could get promoted. Now, do you care to get promoted? Probably not. But if you're going to spend 40 hours in the same place each week, why not get paid more money to be there, right? So if you're going to do just cashiering, why not do shelf stores too? Why not start learning about accounting while there, right? Like whatever it is. What most people don't realize is that even if you're a cashier, in eight years, you could be the store manager making 140K in head of a giant department store with 50 employees. And that's a job in most cases that requires a master's. But people don't realize that because it doesn't sound sexy to work in a supermarket, right? So you see, the idea is we have this perception of what great jobs are. And we don't realize that like great jobs are just people that are just learning how to be great at something. And they do it so great over time that they position themselves into that job. And so when you come into a job with the opportunity and acceptance that even though this may not be the perfect job, you're going to give it your best every day while you're there, then at the very least, you're probably gonna open thousands of doors, you're gonna meet people who are like, I love your enthusiasm, I'd love to hire you for my company, even if you're just a cashier. And you're just gonna get opportunities opening up to you. Versus the other way, it's a guaranteed failure. And so, you know, telemarketing for me wasn't my favorite job, I didn't even understand what telemarketer meant, I thought it was customer service. But when I understood and I saw many people quitting, I said, well, it doesn't matter because if I'm great at it, eventually new things will happen and I have the opportunity to make commissions. And it was the same thing, you know, with the bank. I didn't go there saying, oh, I hope you can give me a job so I can go to school and do the rest of my life. I went in there saying, listen, I understand what it is your bank needs. I'm here to show you that there is value for you to put me in a position to help you. And so, you know, my interview was more me asking questions to the hiring manager asking, Hey, why are five people sitting behind the desk? Isn't the goal, because I understood because this lady that was my mom's friend had given me some insight into what the job was. And she was like, you have to walk the aisles and get clients. And I was like, okay. So I would ask this guy, I was like, why are your five salespeople sitting behind a desk when your job is to get clients? And, you know, at first they made him defensive and he was like, well, this is their break time. And I was like, so all five are allowed to take a break at the same time. Then he questioned his leadership, right? So I was already pissing him off. But then I asked, well, the only reason I asked was, listen, I want to fit into this team and I want to understand the context of what it is you need your people to do. Because my understanding was this was a sales position, even though it was a manager-based job. And the guy was like, yeah, well, that's very true. It's a very good understanding. And I said, my other understanding was that it's about going in the aisles and bringing people back. And he goes, yeah, that's also very true. I said, okay, great. So is this something that you're happy with? with the way it's running right now. He's like, no, it's a very hard task and it takes lots of training. And I said, well, listen, I'm the unusual candidate for a job. I don't have any banking experience. I don't understand your products and services. Honestly, I'm not that great in math to understand all the loans and everything else. What if I had an opportunity to show you that despite not having any of the qualifications necessary, I can be the greatest asset your team's ever had just on the basis of selling sales and sales management and just the idea of understanding how to create relationships with people to everyone here. And he goes, well, how would you do that not knowing the product? Well, I said, let me show you. So I literally walked the aisles and I made friends. I didn't even sell them a banking product. I just made friends telling them I worked at the bank when I didn't even have a business card and I was on an interview. And I asked them if they would come back to me and talk to me while sitting down at the counter. And I brought them back and had them talk to the salespeople there. And the people there were like, how the hell did you do that? Like the first two people you talked to, you brought back. 
And it was A, I knew who to ask, meaning I, I profiled kind of like who would most likely answer me back and talk to me because I understood sales, right? Like sales has a lot to do with understanding human behavior. So I understood that. And then two, it was just this idea of not having this fear towards failure. You know, like, hey, I don't know banking, so it's unlikely that I'm going to get a sale. Well, I wasn't selling a bank. I was selling just a friendship and a relationship. And I sold two people in the supermarket aisles the opportunity for a relationship with me, someone they didn't know, and getting to know me at the bank. And so when I brought him back, it just completely blew this guy's mind. And it just really got him to understand that perhaps what he really needed wasn't just another person that had a degree, another person that had 40 hours of formalized training, but it was someone who really understood the essence of what they were there to do. That's so cool, man. Where, where did you develop that fearlessness or that, the, the ability to act when the fear was there? You, you have to think this way. When you're hanging off a cliff, right? You, let's say you go to the gym and you bench 200 pounds, right? You're like, oh, I'm great. And then you're like, you know what? Next week, I'm going to try to max out at like 240. And you need a spotter, you know, because you're like, you don't want to crush your head. If you're hanging off a cliff, you can suddenly bench 300 pounds. Simply because your adrenaline and your body, your survival instinct kicks in, right? It's the same exact thing here. Think about it in the simplest of manners. I, have, I had a childhood where I had nothing, no money, no nothing, you know, slept in basements and cars and everything else. I got to a point where I said, listen, nothing's going to change. My mom's energy is pretty drained. You know, she's cried her whole life. She's really making ends meet. She has been the greatest mother in the world and has given me everything I can have, meaning shelter and at least food and getting to school and things that people can only at the time was minimalistic, but today I realize it was much more than I could have ever asked for. But I got to a point where I, where I said, you know what? No one is going to give me anything above survival other than myself. So what do I have to lose? Worst case scenario, I fall back on the idea of survival. And, you know, we're back in a basement and I'm still making a few bucks and we're okay and we're eating, you know? Best case scenario, I go for it and things start working out. So I started looking at life in that exact manner. It was simply the idea that if, if I was already at the bottom, what difference was it going to make? You pulled a lot of emotion out of it. Yeah, I mean, emotion is what, you know, emotion is, is really what drives everybody to make all the wrong decisions, right? And everybody, you know, everybody allows life to hit them, and then they have an immediate reaction to that hit. You, you go to a club, you're hanging out, someone punches you, and the first reaction is like, you know what, asshole, like, I'm going to punch you back. But, but the reality is, if you took one second and paused and allow, a, like, a moment to go in between the action and the reaction, to, in your mind, put together... Every scenario why that could have possibly been a harmless hit, an accident, something that wasn't meant to drag on, it is 99% chance that you would actually have a reaction that is favorable to both parties rather than one that creates more uh, of the same problem, right? And it's the same thing. When life hits you with something, you can immediately sit there, cry, feel bad, let the emotion run through your body, and then go solve the problem, right? Or you can solve the problem and then go grief after and feel because once you created the reaction, you may not even need to grieve anymore, right? Like, so same thing happens. What's the first thing that happens when people get in a car accident? They come out of angry, pissed off, like they're just ready to fight someone. And you're like, what's an accident? Obviously the guy wasn't trying to smash you, right? Like he didn't do it because he wanted, he woke up today saying, I'm gonna go smash this guy's car. Like I just feel good about having to go through the insurance and everything else. So what I'm saying is the reaction could be, let the emotion kick in and then startle you. You're maybe not getting the right information on paper. You're not doing the right things. And therefore you go home later and you're like, man, I wish I would have done all these things during this accident. I would have had a better chance of getting the insurance to pay me everything now. I'm old, right? Versus you're calm, you're collected, you take out your phone, you take a video, you take a photo, you get the right information. You don't let the emotion, you go home and then you get pissed off because like it happened. But at least the, the reaction was the favorable one, not the one that, life intended you to have based on the action it hit you. How does that serve you in taking that attitude and approach to other areas of your life? I mean, I, I do this with everything, man. Like, I mean, business has always constant problems in it, you know? Like, I wake up one day and you're like, hey, uh, we've been slapped with a lawsuit. And I'm like, the first reaction is not like, fuck, let me call like 500 people and do this. So first I sit down and I'm like, let's understand what's the issue, you know? It was actually funny. My, my first lawsuit ever was actually a, a very, it was a major company who was like, hey, you, you bashed us in this 
you know, article and we're pretty pissed off. So we're, you know, we're going to sue you because this is taking away our business, you know? So, you know, the first reaction most people have is let me call my lawyer. Let me do this. Let me do that. You know, we're going to fight this, etc. You know what I did? I picked up the phone. I saw the lawyer that was trying to sue me. I picked up the phone and I called him myself. I didn't call my lawyer. I called him myself. And I said, what's the problem? And he goes, well, you guys did this article. You know, my client's not happy with it. I said, okay. Well, I'm not taking down the article. I was like, you know, that's not going to happen. So I was like, but what's the problem in the article? So he goes, well, you're using this one word that we don't like. And he's like, the way it's positioned is it makes us sound worse. I said, fair. What would be an alternative word that you would be happy with? So he goes, this word. So changing one word in the entire thing, and the guy's like, yeah, we're not worried about it. You're good. Have a good day. <laughs> so what could have been a reaction that is an automatic argument, right, in a fight that would have led to 30K in lawyer fees, you know, going to court, figuring it out, only to come back and say, okay, we changed this one word, was just averted because I was consciously alert and, and, and not emotional and said, listen, you have a problem. I'm not here to cause a problem. I'm running a business. You're running a business. My job isn't to hinder yours. I did something that I believe was beneficial to people. You believe it's not. Let's have a conversation about it. He was willing to have a grown-up conversation. When he got off, the last thing he said to me, he said, this is the one and only time a CEO has called me and has legitimately in a calm manner not accused us, fought us or anything, but rather asked how he can help us. And as a result, we solved the problem in 10 minutes and now I can't book my client an additional 40 hours of, you know, lawyer fees. He's like, but you resolve the problem. And to us, that's more than we can ask for. I was like, done. So I was like, you look good. You resolved the problem to your client in 10 minutes, right? You didn't have to go to court and anything. And we didn't have any fees. We didn't have any problems. And everybody's happy. It's just this idea that, you know, society has so many blocks for us. Like you have to do things this way. You have to do that. And what if you do this, you know? And, and that's what happens. I mean, look, uh, how many times do we get pulled over by cops, right? And the first defensive mechanism is, I didn't do it. I wasn't doing it. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, like I wasn't speeding. And the first thing I say is, yeah, I was being an idiot. I'm sorry. I completely screwed up over there and I did that. Nine out of 10 times I get away with no ticket, just a warning and a conversation about a cool car or something. But, you know, in many cases, when we start an argument, which is being defensive and being angry and being emotional, it leads to nothing. You know? So... How does this tie into self-awareness? Because I know that's probably the biggest message you, you pre practice in, preach, not only in your book, in your podcast, and anytime I've seen or read anything or listened to anything, like any content you put out. Well, you know, there, there's, first off, there's a difference that we, we need to make clear here is that awareness and self-awareness are two very different things. I think that people have in the media done a very good job at bringing them together. They speak of awareness and they're like, someone who's very alert and capable within an environment. But reality is there, there's two types of awareness. And awareness is just someone's alertness or ability to understand what's happening. Like, you know, someone can be very alert and aware and powerful in the sense of walking in a room and understanding exactly what's happening at all times and not being a pawn or being marketed to, et cetera. You know, very alert, very aware, right? But, but that's only step one. And I think many people today, thanks to the amount of information shared out there, thanks to the amount of Facebook and all the digital information that's out there, our capacity for communication and being aware has enhanced tremendously from 10 years ago. So any young person, which is typically why young people don't fall for old people's leadership styles in corporate America, because they're like, I'm not buying this bullshit. I've seen it a hundred times, 99 out of hundred, everybody's lying, you know? So, and that's also why people don't buy politicians in the news anymore, right? They've seen so many disparities that most people now have a heightened sense of awareness thanks to the high level of information shared and access to information and technology. However, self-awareness is a whole different ballgame. Self-awareness is not your alertness or awareness of the environment, but it is rather your ability to take the information your environment has given you and act within it. So not only you understand what is happening in your environment, but you understand how you belong to the environment. And so self-awareness is typically the reason between why someone has an idea and never starts a business, and someone has an idea and immediately starts a business. So if you think about awareness, that's where the idea comes from. I'm aware of things, I'm identifying problems, I found a solution, okay, that's awareness. Most people have great ideas, most people know the solution to those ideas. Very few people 
take that leap forward and start a business or become entrepreneurial and do something about it or quit their jobs and go after it, right? And the reason that is because self-awareness is all about internally yourself. So it's about your confidence level. It's about your skills, your passion, your understanding of yourself. Like, do you even know what your talents are? You know, I've told you earlier that my talent is teaching, right? And so, you know, I have to have enough self-awareness to be able to identify these patterns in my skills and say, yeah, I'm a talented teacher. And that's where I'd like to make business or books or anything else a vehicle to get that teaching to people rather than looking at it as, oh, it's, uh, it's all about like I'm going to become a teacher. That's a unilateral vision of someone who's not self-aware, right? So someone who's aware would say, I'm a teacher. Obviously, where can I go teach? Someone who's very self-aware would say, well, I'm a teacher. What vehicles can I use or how can I leverage this talent to move my life forward? You know, not necessarily having to teach someone one-on-one or to teach in a classroom. So, you know, the idea of self-awareness is that if you, if you have, for example, a great idea and you understand your skills your co- and you have the confidence, then you typically are ready to get started, meaning you understand what you need to get something done. You have the drive to, get, to go and get it. And then the idea becomes a business and you're on to your journey. If you lack that self-awareness, you have a great idea, but you don't know yourself enough to know what your skills, talents, or you lack the confidence, the self-confidence and everything in between to get the ball rolling. So typically I say self-awareness is something very important that people don't talk about because it is the, the, the bridge between vision and execution. And so it's something that a lot of people don't talk about out there, which is why I've kind of made it my uh, kind of journey to, to educate people on this idea that you need to be a better human being if you're going to be a more successful one. And I think people always want to skip that step because everybody is always asking, what do I need to do to be successful? What business do I need to start? How do I make money, right? So I tell you, I'll give you this final example. I don't want to hear fuck you too long. Forgive me for saying that. But, you know, think about it this way. If you are going to a gym and you're saying, I need a trainer, the trainer's going to teach you how to use every machine, correct, in the gym. And you're going to be like, damn, I'm equipped to be an incredible athlete now because I understand how to use every machine here. But who is training you to make sure you show up at 7 a.m. every day, 7 to 10, and you're in the gym doing your thing? Who's teaching you to not allow distractions to prevent you from entering that gym? Who's giving you the drive and the motivation to get up in the morning, even when you have a cold, and show up at the gym and do alternate exercises instead? Well, you are. And this is the problem. No one is training you to be a better person. People are training you to use the tools society has given you. People are training you to give you uh, like training on the job on how to be better bankers, lawyers, how to be better mechanics and technicians. But they're not teaching you the key quality of how to be a better human being, a, a better internal person that allows you to ultimately amplify all the other skills you have and become the person you are striving to become. Who's the person that you had to become to get to where you are today? versus where you were, let's say, 10 years ago? Well, I had to filter out this idea that someone was going to feel sorry for me or someone was going to help me. You know, like long ago, I gave up this idea that I was going to catch a break. I think this is the thing that most people have in there. They're like, I just need one person to believe in me. I just need one person to invest in my idea. I just need one guy to pull me up and take me under his wing, you know? And, And I think years, years ago, when I was very, very young, I gave that up. And I think that was the greatest thing that's helped me become the person I am because I've, I've decided to rely on nobody but myself. I've decided that I was going to be the only one to create the outcome I wanted and nobody else was going to be that one push ahead I needed. What event led to you or situation or story you had to share where you came to that realization? Well, I mean, it was, I think I've shared it in my book as well one time. It wasn't necessarily something that pushed me into I had never caught a break, you know, being young, meaning every time, like, even when I wanted a job at McDonald's, nobody ever said, hey, you know what, I'll hire you under the radar. No, nobody cared. You know, I knew people were working there illegally, but nobody would take a shot on me. So I figured, I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, people, nobody will give me a chance, you know? And then I started realizing I got to create my own chance. And what, what one of the key moments in my life that really reminded me of that was that it, it wasn't I had to create my own chance when it came to just the basic survival skills I needed, I needed to create my own chance when it came to being super successful. 
And what happened is me and my uncle went on a test drive. He was, he was pretty well off. He wasn't super wealthy, but was a well off corporate America guy. And uh, I, it was time to buy me a car, meaning it was time for me to uh, be, get a car to go to school. You know, I was entering that phase and, and he, we were looking at the time, I was like 15 years old and I was like, I had just started that job, that telemarketing job, I hadn't yet made any good money. So, but I was making enough to afford a car payment, you know? So he takes me on to, to go test driving and I'm getting excited because like we're at the Chevy dealership, we're going to drive Camaros and Corvettes. And I'm like, yes, this is it. You know, like baller status coming up. My uncle's like stepping up. He's my savior, you know? So we go on this test drive. He puts the top down on the Z28 and I'm like getting excited. And after we come back, I'm like, so are we buying it? He's like, what are we buying? I was like, are we buying this car? He's like, well, I might buy it. I was like, oh, you're buying it for me. He's like, well, what would it buy you a Z28? I was like, well, I thought, what the hell am I doing here then? He's like, oh, no, I thought you'd enjoy going on a ride in Z28. I was like, but this is bullshit. Like, how you put this in front of me? And like, then tell me I can't have it. And then I realized really quick that when he goes, he's like, well, I'll help you buy a Corolla. You can make your own payments or whatever. And I was like, I don't want a Toyota Corolla. Which high school kid wants a Toyota Corolla? You know, you don't, you don't get any girls with a Toyota Corolla. You get girls with a Z28. That doesn't make any sense. And I was kind of chubby and I was kind of younger. You know, I wasn't like a good looking guy or anything. So I was like, I need a car, man. I'm never going to get laid. You know? So he goes, uh, he's like, you can't have this Z28 because this is too much power and this and that. So he gave me a hundred reasons why I couldn't have that car. And, you know, in my mind, the first thing that came to me is, okay, first off, the thing I hated more than anything else that had ever happened in my life was someone I cared about telling me that I couldn't have something I wanted. And so that really triggered something in my mind that really made me accept the idea that if my family wasn't going to help me get the things I want in life, then a stranger wasn't going to be that, that help that's going to get me there either. I was going to have to be my own help. You know, I was going to have to figure out my own way to get to that Z28. And that's what really pushed me to become really good at telemarketing. Because I was like, what choice do I have? If I don't make my commissions, I'm not making any money but this bullshit $12 an hour. So I started making my commissions and I went to $2,500 a week. And guess what my first car was? It was a Pontiac uh, Firehawk 1LE, which was a better version of that Z28. You know, so, and it, and it was bought cash, you know, and it was just exciting to say, you know what? I did it for all the wrong reasons, but I did it just to prove to myself, not that you know, someone else said you couldn't have this, but rather that I, yes, I could have it if I was willing to work for it. And I think the lesson here is really simple. Many people are told they can't have something in life. You know, like our family tell us, you know, you got to be reasonable. You got to look ahead. You got to be uh, looking at goals that are realistic, get a degree, get a job, get 50K a year for 10 years, and then figure out your path. I tell people this, it, I hear so often by people telling me, hey, you know what? I want to prove everybody wrong. I want to prove my family wrong. I want to prove my friends wrong. They said I couldn't make it. That's the number one reason you're going to fail out there is trying to prove people wrong. You got to start proving yourself right. That's a, there's a big difference. You got to start holding your commitment to yourself, not so much worrying about proving that other people's lack of beliefs in you was justifiable or non-justifiable based on your actions. Because when you say you're going to prove people wrong, your drive is only as good as their motivation to see you fail. And guess what happens when you don't succeed quick enough? People stop giving a shit. And no one stops believing in you. They just don't care. They never cared to begin with. It was easier to not believe in you than to believe in you. So they just said, hey, you'll never make it because I never made it. Fuck it. Have a good day. But reality is if you start proving yourself right, then the only person you start learning to hold yourself accountable to is yourself. When you tell yourself, hey, I'm going to have a, a Ferrari by 23, you need to hold that word. Because the more you hold that word, the more you realize that when you set goals, they're not just like random goals you're pushing out there. They're real goals that you believe in, that you're willing to put the work behind to see come to life. So someone that was in that, that moment, right, where they suddenly realize in their life that they're not just going to get things given to them. They have to work for things, right? What, I'm trying to think of what I want to ask here. So. What helped, you know, if, if they want to build that confidence to achieve things that they decide, their own outcomes, not what other people believe in them, do they want to start with small successes along the way or extensive, like, go for the Lambo, right? Like, what is, does it just depend on the person? Because you've helped a lot of people succeed and grow. 
So what well, you know, I understand what you're asking. It depends on the person, but it also depends on the understanding that success is gradual. It's not overnight. So, you know, I think having a long-term vision of, and a, I hate putting cars or lifestyle as a vision uh, because usually when you're why, there's two types of motivation in the world. There's the external and internal. External motivation is like Ferraris, Lamborghinis, lifestyle, travel, family, you know, all that shit. Yep. Internal motivation is your why you do what you do. So, you know, if you have a reason why you want something to succeed, meaning like, hey, I want to change the way people get drinking water. Okay, that's the reason you're going to get out of bed in the morning every day at 6 a.m. and work. Now, external motivation, like the reward basis, those are good for reminders along the way of what's coming. But they're not awesome for like getting out of bed in the morning. Because when you suffer for like, six months in a row with lack of sleep and you want to punch someone in the face because you're not getting any success, trust me, the last thing you give a shit about is a Ferrari. And you start giving no shits about cars, lifestyle, or anything else. And you start getting really depressed because it's not coming. So when your external motivation is just lifestyle or, or anything related to that, you know, and these goals that are kind of the rewards of entrepreneurship, not the, the journey, then, then ultimately what happens is it doesn't come fast enough for most people, you know, there's some people who have huge success early, but that's not the norm. And so what happens is it turns into a giant disappointment, kills your confidence, prevents you from succeeding, and, and it makes it much harder to start again. You know, you fell off the bike real hard and you're not going to get back up for another year. On the other hand, once you stay motivated because you, you believe in the purpose of what you work on, in the long term, what ends up happening is nobody can, can take that away from you. You know, it doesn't matter like well, that you see Ferraris or not on the road, you're just going to still be motivated because you're seeing progress towards that goal. And that goal is in your hands and you're working on it every day. Even if it's minimal, you're seeing that progress. But, but with money, you're not seeing the money until the very end. And so what ends up happening is it's not gradual, right? So it's not feeding your confidence as you go, it's the opposite. So, you know, I think people should have long-term visions of what they want their lives to look like. They should have long-term visions of what their goals are, but they should also have yearly goals to kind of show themselves that they're graduating and they're moving forward. You know, you don't go to school and come out with a four year degree. You go to school and graduate each year towards the next year. Get it? And, and I think it's the same exact thing with life. You don't go to, you, you don't go to life and say, Hey, in six years I'm out, I'm a billionaire. You don't, you gradually build wealth to become a billionaire and you gradually build, you know, assets and you gradually build uh, achievements and accomplishments and, you know, rewards come with it. But ultimately, I think it's very, very important that, that if someone uh, wants to kind of take these steps, they need to understand one very important concept in success, and it's that failure uh, is, is a necessity for your confidence. Because the only way you build confidence is by practice. The only reason, I mean, you, you, you were in college and I had that luck to have all the chicks in school and stuff. You're a better looking guy than I am. But if you think about like, if you think about being in college, uh, like look at the guys that get all the girls in school, right? They're usually the guys that are most comfortable talking, talking to them. They're not trying to pick up girls. They're just natural talkers because they practice talking. Like they're always talking and because they're never asking for numbers, but they're still getting shut down even though they're not asking, but because they're talking, they're getting used to this idea of failure and failure is becoming part of the equation. It's not the end of the road. It's just a bump that you slow down for and you keep going. And, and because of that, they end up getting a lot more checks than everybody else because they, they figured out how to talk to people. And they figured it out through practice versus the really good guy who's maybe the best boyfriend a girl will ever have because he's a caring guy, he's not a player, whatever, but has never really talked and is really awkward and walks up to a girl and asks for a number and the first thing he gets is get the fuck out of here. And his confidence gets shot to shit, right? And then he won't ask another girl after six months. The odds are that guy will probably never marry the girl he really wants. He'll marry the girl that life will give him or will present him at any given point in his life and open an opportunity for him to talk to because he will always have that block where he's not practicing that skill. And so, you know, the essence is you have to fail in order to understand that failure doesn't hurt. And, and I think the fear of the pain is what prevents people from being successful. The fear of the financial loss of a business is what prevents people from starting. You know, they're like, well, I could lose my confidence. I could lose some money. Uh, I'd rather not do that right now. But there's hundreds of ways to start a business that is not related to money and that would not make you lose a dollar. The, the point becomes that most people are so focused 
on their own selves, you know, instead of the situation because they're emotional about everything. So they don't see anything past the comfort zone. When you're creating business and you're trying to define the role in it, how do you separate, and this may be me asking this for myself, how do you separate your own self-interests from the functionality of the business when you say, I want a certain lifestyle with it? Because it's very easy to make in my opinion, in my experience, to make decisions on how I run my business, how I, what I have my staff do, uh, based off of my own personal interests and lifestyle I want. And that's okay. I think the, in order to be successful, you have to separate what is entrepreneurship, what is business. Entrepreneurship is about innovating change, is about facilitating change, and it is about bringing change to the masses. And it is to get it uh, accepted by the masses, to create uh, a new way of thinking for people through business, right? Business, the goal of business is to create revenue and to be profitable. A, a successful entrepreneurial venture is what is adapted by the masses. Uh, a successful business is about what makes the most money. Now, if you are honest with yourself when starting a business or an entrepreneurial venture, then there's nothing wrong with that. If you say, listen, I'm in, the, I'm in the credit repair business. Okay, I wanna help people, but ultimately I wanna get rich off of it. That's fine, that is a business. You're providing a service, you're gonna collect the fee, you're gonna do that really well over time. The better and more you help people, the more you're rewarded with more fees, right? And the more money you make, and the more that obviously trends to your lifestyle. You want a Ferrari, you want a nice house, you don't wanna do any work, you want a staff, you wanna automate. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. There, but, but to say that you're an entrepreneur because you own a credit repair business and help people is foolish. Get it? Like, because there's other people trying to solve the energy crisis, trying to solve, you know, the fact that you can have the internet in places that don't have the internet or, you know, in things of the sort that facilitates change for entire communities, countries, or, or, or groups of people and who are not going to care about making a few bucks along the way, but who are going to be rewarded substantially more than you ever will in a business in the long term should they succeed their rate of success is much less it takes which is why i usually recommend people start with businesses before being entrepreneurs because a business is a vehicle to bring entrepreneurship to the masses which is why you look at an uber it's a great great idea it's facilitated but it's only profitable when it turns into a real business you know and starts collecting fees and everything else from people and so the, the business vehicle is the mass acceptance for entrepreneurs, you know, but in businesses, there's also ways for you to be entrepreneurial and innovate your industry or your field or your technology or whatever, and help others facilitate that are doing similar things. You know? And these are smaller entrepreneurial things you do over time that allow you to boost your confidence to say, Hey, I've solved all of these great problems. I've made a couple of hundred thousand bucks, you know, or a million bucks. Now I'm ready to take on a very large problem. And you know, some of these large problems, they do require money. You can't just go into it with no money, you know? You, you can't just say, I want to solve the problem. I want to put space shuttles on Mars, but I want to start that with none of my own money. You know, no, you got to go in and say, hey, I've built 20 different companies. I have all of this support from the, uh, from the business community. I have half a billion dollars I'm throwing in there myself. You're going to be taken seriously, right? Now you can say, I want to solve a, a $20 billion or a trillion dollar problem but I'm doing it with a million of my own money, you see? So it's all perspective, right? Because you can solve a million dollar problem with zero money, but you have to solve a trillion dollar problem with a billion dollars, get it? So, so it, all, it all goes down to perspectives, which is why I would say all of us play life with a different zero. The game is the same thing, we just add zeros to the type of game we're playing, but it's the same game. You know, like if you're, if you're trading stocks and I'm trading stocks, we might both be trading the same stocks and, and the same kind of companies and doing the same strategy, but we're doing it with different zeros. So my gains may be greater, your gains may be lower, but we're still both winning, get it? And so over time, you'll add zeros and someone under you won't have any zeros in their bank account, you know? So it'll just be kind of this continuous game that the idea is that the, the whole business, everything in life, it's very, very simple. It's just not easy, that's the difference. What would you say are your success principles? And before I forget, I do want to go into the third circle theory right after this. So I don't know if you could tie the two together, but what would you say are your success principles you've applied to your personal life and all of your professional endeavors and you know, what 
what are those that you can share with others? I think, uh, and I can't tie it into Third Circle, but there, there's a Third Circle, I'll kind of briefly give an overview for people who may not have heard of it. So Third Circle theory is about three independent circles that run your life, which is why it's applicable no matter that you're a billionaire or uh, a starving kid on the street trying to figure out what to do. It's the circle of circumstances, the first circle. We're all born in a circumstance, and we have to overcome that. The second circle is the mastery of society. We all have to be able to eventually learn to adapt, work within, and grow past the idea that we work within a system or a society. And then third is to separate the fact that mastery of society does not mean that you're fulfilled and have a great life, and therefore you must understand that there's a third piece to this, which is the third circle, the mastery of life, your purpose, and the reason why you're here which is greater than just the idea of satisfying the institution or so what you call society. And so, you know, the key is to understand that the three are different phases we all go through. The majority of people never graduate the first circle. Very few people find themselves having success in the second. And eventually, very few people end up graduating in the third. This is why we only have 1% of the population that owns the majority of the wealth, you know, and so on the division keeps getting greater. More people need to be seeking their purpose and need to be seeking their greatness rather than being lost in their circumstance. And so that's very important. Uh, this, this is why the book exists, ultimately. Now, to my own principles, I think very, a few things that I, I think have attributed to my success is the division of institution and life. I think very, very often uh, people get looped into this thing where it's like, I matter because of the titles that society has allowed me to achieve, you know, like, or I matter because of the degree I have. I matter because the job I have says VP on it. I matter because, you know, I'm important because I made $250,000 last year and the government said I was in the top 1%. So whatever that is, that is what the institution has given you. And, and very often, very few people realize how irrelevant these things are until they lose them. Someone doesn't realize how irrelevant, irrelevant they were in their job until they lose that job and they realize that nobody will talk to them just because they were the VP of so and so. Nobody cares anymore because they're not in that job anymore. So what ends up happening is people need to start understanding earlier rather than after life has punched them in the face that they are fully in control of the title they want to have in life and that they need to create a life around that and live what they believe. And I think that a lot of people aren't willing to do that because A, they're afraid that what they believe will not lead them anywhere. And B, they just don't know what to believe because they don't know themselves enough. So, you know, I think that my, my first rule for success has always been never allow something that isn't, that isn't possible by the eyes of others to become your reality. You know, if someone tells you, oh, this has never been done before, or this isn't possible, or hey, you can't do that. Don't look at that as a, as a, as a block or as a stopping ground. Look at that as criticism. Look at that as feedback. Hey, people have tried this before. They failed. Don't just take it for granted. Look at what they've done and why they failed so you don't repeat the mistake seven times before you figure out it wasn't going to work their way either. But instead, understand that it doesn't mean it can't be done. It means that no other person that's put their minds to it was able to figure it out. And so it creates, instead of saying it creates a block, I look at it as it creates a unique opportunity to do something no one else has been able to do, which I find pretty cool and I look at it as a good thing, not as a bad thing. I like solving problems people haven't solved, you know? How do you, how do you, with that one principle, how do you separate the, well, okay, based on the information and feedback and lessons from others, this is not a reality or a possibility versus screw that, I can make this happen. Like, where do you decide in your mind? What helps well, well, remember that the difference between vision and execution is self-awareness, right? So, so what I told them, the, the bridge is self-awareness. People shared a vision before. Like you have a vision, I have a vision. You might have tried it and failed and I'm looking at it and saying, okay, he tried it. He didn't do very well, you know? Now, knowing that, right? I need to understand my own skills, my own talents, my own drive and understand if do I have a competitive advantage over you? You know, like you, you may say like, hey, I had a million dollars to start this project. I still failed. I may say, okay, I don't have a million dollars maybe right now to start this project or I'm not willing to commit it to it, but what do I have he didn't have? Well, maybe I have the most unique set of resources in the world that you didn't have access to because I tried this five years after you, right? So there's more technology now. There's more things that make it easier for me to do it. So I have to understand the context 
of why I am the right fit to bring this idea to life. And I think this is the big difference is you have to be honest with yourself. This is where awareness kicks in like circle one mentality of overcoming the circumstance. You have to be honest with yourself enough to say, Hey, listen, am I the person to bring this idea to life? I mean, we all have ideas, right? But are our ideas aligned with our skills, talents, confidence, and opportunities? And if they're not, then why are we wasting time on ideas that have nothing to do with us? You know, I mean, if I have nothing to do with the automotive space, so someone says, listen, we're going to build a brand new car and go out there and, you know, kill it and put Ferrari out of business. I'm looking at my life and I'm like, listen, I'm not an auto manufacturer. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a designer. You know, there's all of these things that would make me very successful in what you're saying are not here. So what the hell am I doing here? Someone would say, well, you're an investor. Okay, great. Who are the other people that have that talent that we need? Do we have a designer? Do we have an engineer? Do we have this? No, no, we'll just buy them. Okay, no, it's not going to work. I'm out. You know, it's not going to be a good type of idea to go after. You, you want ideas that are focused on, remember, taking your talents to people. And that can be your ability to speak and present or your connections and relationships. There, there is people that are talented designers, right? They can be designers in one company for, you know, like for something some, as simple as like a car and they're designing for Ford, you know, as a job. And suddenly they're like, you know what? I'm a very talented designer. I'm going to design my own wheels. And now I have my own wheel company and I'm going to hire talent to do the sales, marketing, and everything else. But, but remember, a wheel is only as good as its design. So it's a design driven business. So the question becomes, are you able to identify the vehicles that allow you to get your talents into people? But if you say, Hey, I'm going to go into uh, like the food and produce and I need to design a site. Well, that's a very limited scope of where your design work can go, right? Cause you can't design the fruit. Get it? So what ends up happening is, is that uh, the best industry to apply a design background to? Of course not. You have to understand where is the core success of the company going to result on the exposure of your talent? The second principle. That you <clears throat> I'm sorry? What's the second principle that you live by? So, you know, something else that's been like, I, I think, very important in my life is I don't make excuses why things don't happen. Meaning like, uh, uh, this has been like true, I think since I've been a very little kid, I don't wait for things to happen. I don't make excuses why they don't happen. If we, if I say I'm going to do something, I get it done. There is zero, zero uh, gap between the time where I say I'm going to do something and the time I'm already starting doing it and putting it in motion. There's times where I'm actually getting on the phone with people to put something in motion before I even said I'm going to get it done. Just because, you know, I understand that once my word means everything to me. And, and this is something that I think is very true uh, to a lot of people that have found a lot of success. Like I've interviewed a lot of people in the Secret Entourage Academy, and I think all of them kind of share this trait. And it's that if you say you're going to get something done, you just go out there and get it done. Like there's no, there's no like reason why it can't be done. There's no reason. Like if you said it, you, you believed you could do it. So just go and prove to yourself that you can actually hold true to it, you know, and get it done. The, nobody said it was going to be easy. Nobody said it's going to be, hey, you said it and tomorrow morning it's going to happen. But just get it done. Like meaning hold your word. Even if it doesn't get done in the time frame you expected, even if it wasn't as exciting as you thought, get it done. And, and part of the reason is you never want to escape from failure. You know, we hear many times people say things like, hey, I don't like living in this city. I'm going to try this other city and I'll find more success because it's a bigger city or it has more things going on. But reality is we're running away from our inability to make something work. But our inability to make something work is about our inability to know ourselves to make it work. So if we hadn't had success in Texas, the odds are we're not gonna have success in LA, we're not gonna have success in New York until we resolve our internal issues that are preventing us from success in general. So it's full ownership. Yeah, I mean, look, who owns your life but you? Who's gonna drive your Ferrari when you earn it, right? Like who else is gonna say, hey, it's mine too, I earned it with you, nobody. Who's going to live in your big ass house? Nobody, right? Like you are, you know what I mean? And whoever you choose to live there. So, so that burden of getting there is only on you. There's nobody else that's going to help you get there. And people are like, well, I need help. No, you don't. You think you need help because you're weak. So you need to go back and start studying the idea of not being weak. And eventually you'll realize you don't need help. You don't need a spotter at the gym. It's nice to have a spotter. There's plenty of people who have been very successful athletes without spotters. 
It doesn't mean having a spotter is not a luxury or a convenience. It doesn't mean having a nice Mac AirBook Pro is not a, you know, is not a nice thing when you're an author. But if you really want to write, guess what? If you don't have, if you don't have a computer, write on a piece of paper. Right? Write six. If, if you if you are meant to write, find a way to write. Don't use reasons why you can't do it. Don't give yourselves reason uh, why you're gonna fail. So therefore, like because that's your fear speaking. It's like, oh, I want to be an author. I don't have a high end computer like some of the best authors in the world have. You know. And it's like, well, you're not some of the best authors in the world. You're a dude with, with a book idea. Let's start writing about it. Okay, go to the library. Oh, well, the library closes at 6. Okay, work 30 minutes a day. Get there at 5.30, write 30 minutes a day. Write the rest on a piece of paper, type it in the library for 30 minutes a day. You know, write one page a day. You'd be done with your book in less than a year, you know? So what I'm saying is, like, just do it. Like, stop using reasons why it can't happen and start doing small steps towards getting into a bigger picture rather than just looking at, oh, here's every reason why I'll never make it or you'll never be good. That's probably I, the most practical personal development thing I've ever heard in my life. And, and I mean, look at it this way. I mean, it, it's, it's really, really simple, but you know, people always want the big end goal. But I mean, look, I have to write 10 books to realize that A, it's hard and B, you know, I'm not a great author, I'm a teacher, and, and the only book that I really owned up to, and I said, you know what, I wrote 11, I understood what didn't, I wrote 10, I didn't I understood what didn't work. My 11 was, was Third Circle Theory. And guess what, I didn't write it from the perspective of an author like I was writing the other 10, I wrote it from the perspective of a teacher. And so I allowed my talent to manifest itself through writing instead of trying to get a message out to people through writing. What do you want to be known for when it's all said and done? <sighs> having, given, having given people, having put hope back in the hands of people. I think that's the, that's the biggest, uh, that's my biggest legacy. You know, like I've impacted so many people through Third Circle, the academy and things I do. I love to see people not be victims of their environments. I love to see people not turn on the TV and be like, this is the end of the world, the era of doom. And, you know, I understand things are not perfect in the world. I'm not stupid. I see it. You know, I'm not blind to the reality. But the reality is that while those things are ongoing, there are things that many people can do today, right now, that have no correlation to anything going on in the world to get themselves to a level to genuinely make an impact on those things. What's the point of yelling and pissing away shit all over the TV, you know, like when nothing's going to change, right? But guess what? If you're like, look at Starbucks CEO. Like, I love that guy, like uh, Howard Schultz. Like, you know, Trump says something on TV. He's like, we're banning people. It's like, I'm hiring refugees in all my Starbucks. Well, okay. Well, what are you gonna What are you gonna do? Like, you're Trump. You're gonna stand up to a guy like Howard Schultz, who's got ten times more money and more influence than you do, and say what? Like, oh, you can't do that shit. He's like, fuck you. Yeah, I'll lawyer up, and you lawyer up, and you probably do. You know? And that's the idea. Like, the, the idea is, in order to be powerful. You have to first understand that you can never be powerless and you can never be hopeless. And when that strain comes into you, then you allow the track record you build, you allow the steps you take to put you in a position where no one can ever take that away from you. Even if you look at something as large as, you know, like a, a conflict of that magnitude, you can still look at it and say, listen, I am a person that is now in the capacity to make sure others don't feel that. You know, and so I'm going to step in and use my leverage in the proper way. I think, you know, someone like that, I consider truly living in the third circle. Someone like uh, our wonderful president I see as someone living in the second circle in the idea of institution, monetizing, capitalism, and just constantly self-gain and how do we make deals to make things happen for us, you know? They're securing their future, but other people have the capacity, and anybody in that position has the capacity to truly make an impact on the world and help others. Thank you. Who have been your three biggest influences or mentors that you've learned from? So I've never had a mentor per se, because I think most people misunderstand mentorship. They think mentorship is someone that comes and holds your hand and tells you what to do. Uh, people, I've observed thousands of people through my lifetime. I think I've, uh, I've interviewed now over 350 people in the academy that have been all incredible role models and people I look up to. And I think 
Uh, some make a lot less money than me. Some have had less success, but I still look up to that incredible spirit and ability to be a human and help others, etc. cetera, uh, true business and entrepreneurship. But uh, I think that the, the two people that made a significant impact in my life, I would say three people actually. Uh, my mom has always been an inspiration when it comes to watching someone never give up. Uh, that, I think that has been the key of what I've learned from my mom. Someone who's gone through adversity, failure, lots of beating, life has taken a toll on them and they still stand tall with energy and with an incredible amount of, of aura and positivity despite what the world hits them. And they see beauty in the smallest of things and appreciate the smallest of things. And I, I will never be the person my mom is to have regards. And so I always look up to that, you know, even today as someone that I can watch and say, you know what, I admire the human being that person is. Uh, another person I met through my business career that I appreciated very much, much, and I've actually become very close friends with, uh, that I, I respect as a human being as well as a business leader within the community is my good friend, uh, Fabio Viviani, a chef. Uh, out of Chicago, just incredible human being. Uh, we get along very well. We share a lot of similar hobbies and just hang out from time to time. Really enjoy any conversation we have, regardless of this business or anything else. It's always great to meet people that are at your level that also have in a completely different industry, have found tremendous success and can teach you in their own ways, you know, things that have worked for them. Uh, so every fun conversation still becomes an incredible learning experience, even if it's shooting the shit and talking about nothing, you know, like it's always good. Uh, and then I think a third person that has always been someone that I've looked up to from a selflessness standpoint, and I think I've taken a lot of my selflessness through them, has been my uncle who uh, throughout my upbringing with my mom took a role of my dad and really helped. And he had his own problems too, but he really helped uh, kind of facilitate um, making sure I have uh, all the tools necessary to at least uh, prepare myself for success. So I think those three people have been the, the people that I, I grant a lot of my success to this time. And what would you like people listening to know? Entrepreneurs, people that want to make a change in their life or just want more I'd like people to, to understand that they need to stop scamming themselves out of a good life. You know, I think too many times people go into things with the expectancy of results, and this is where they make their biggest mistakes. Uh, you know, people take job opportunities based on the income they're going to receive. People um, go learn educational things based on the immediate money they'll make out of the education they receive or the money they'll make in the future. Everything always comes back down to how much money can I make from learning this or from doing that? And, and I think more people need to slow down a second and say, education isn't broken down into formal or self-education. Education is education. And education is not bound by the rewards it provides you. Education is bound by the abilities it helps you create and the opportunities it opens your eyes to see. And I think that if, like if more people got exposed to more industries and more things, even if they weren't going to make a dollar, even if they weren't interested, they would be better rounded off individuals. It doesn't matter that they're in business or that they're working for others or not. The more you understand how things work, the more effective you are in working within systems that may employ or not employ some of these things you learn. I learned real estate and I was a banker. That opened up an opportunity six years later to make over a million dollars flipping lots. I never became a realtor. I never cared to become a real estate investor. It was never my thing. I learned because I wanted to make sure I don't get scammed on my own property. Okay, you learn, right? It doesn't mean you learn to make money. Uh, I learned stock trading. I didn't care to trade stocks. I actually didn't trade stocks until almost a decade later when I actually ended up buying stocks that everybody else said were the worst decisions you could ever make. And yet they turned into uh, a tremendous amount of money uh, well above the eight-figure mark over just taking chances in something that people said was impossible. But if I didn't know how to trade stocks, I would have never taken those chances because I would have believed anything I'm told, right? So all I'm saying is that just education is the key to opportunity because it enhances. The more you know, curiosity is the key to education. Education is the key to opportunity. And ultimately, all of these things together 
are what creates a better, more aware and self-aware person. So, so I think if people are listening, I urge them to, to learn for the sake of learning, not for the sake of making. And I urge them to try to understand that everything in life can be considered a scam. Everything in life is good and bad. And nothing in life is good and bad. Everything in life comes down to the choices you make and not the positive or negative values associated with them, but the experiences that come as a result of making those choices. Well said. What would you like our listeners to know about Secret Honorage, uh, Secret Academy, everything you have out there, and also how can they find you? So I want everybody that possibly is listening to this to go and definitely pick up Third Circle Theory before anything else. Uh, definitely read the book because it's just a book. And it doesn't matter what your income level is. It doesn't matter what your status is. The book is going to change your life. The way I got that book to become a bestseller is I offered people $100 if it didn't change their life when we first launched it. And on one hand, I can count out of the 200,000 plus copies we sold, how many people actually came back and asked me for that. Uh, the book will change your life. I promise you it will. Uh, you can get it at thirdcirclebook.com. You can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, anywhere they sell a book. I'm sure by now people that are listening to this know how to buy a book. Uh, so get the book wherever that is. And then for the academy, it's not an entrepreneur academy. It's not a business academy. It's just, it's an academy that encompasses all aspects of business, entrepreneurship, awareness, and the idea of understanding business. And you can find that at secretacademics.com. Uh, it, it's just a great opportunity for you to hear from some of today's most accredited entrepreneurs, how they've done it, what they're doing in a way that's not only sexy, entertaining, and not boring. Like you're not going to sit and watch hours and hours of video. I tell people if you watch 30 minutes a day, you watch one interview a day, even an interview that you may not have had an interest in because it wasn't a field you cared about. I guarantee you by the end of the year, you're going to come back and you're going to say, I have never had a better year than the, than the year I've had because I now know and understand more things than I've ever known. And the cost, our, our ability to bring this cost down to $200 as a one-time fee for an opportunity like this is tremendous because I've made enough money in my life that I don't make any money off of Secret Entourage. So all of the, all of the things that Secret Entourage does helps fund more educational entrepreneur programs across the globe. And so I'm very proud to have been able to bring a price point to a level where even people in low to moderate income communities can afford it. It does not require you to buy textbooks. It does not require you to buy additional add-ons or more money spent. You know, it is a one-time fee. It's updated every week with more content and it's going to be updated for the next decade or so unless something happens to me and something else I can't control. But until then, we're going to continue to shape and change the way people seek education in the world everywhere. Guys, uh, if you, you know, are thinking about it, start with the book. I swear it's worth every penny times 10. If, you know, so I personally want to vouch for, and there's no payoff on my end. Like I genuinely do believe in what these guys do. Uh, and also the Academy they have is awesome, incredible content. You know, a lot of membership sites and stuff. They just, it's like a lot of fluff and filler content. This is, these are real interviews with real people that are making real impacts, not some guy teaching someone how to sell a coaching business so they could go and sell a coaching business or something, you know, network marketing or MLM. Not that there's anything wrong with that stuff, but this is practical entrepreneurship and business at its core. So uh, do check them out. We'll be linking to them in the show notes. So you'll be easily be able to find it. Uh, PJ, thank you for your time. Before I let you leave, I need to ask for one quote or idea you live by? Ah, one quote or idea I live by. To believe you can or can't, you are certainly right. By, uh, I believe it was Henry Ford who said it, and I, I'm a big believer of that. And you know, actually, it's funny. That was the quote I believed in the most when I was growing up. And the quote that recently became the pillar of coaching so many people that I realized is a, is a true quote that may resonate with people is the greatest enemy to a great life is a good life. Don't let comfort, you know, prevent you from learning what discomfort feels like. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. And I'm sure you're going to have a lot more people showing up to the Academy after hearing all the awesome stuff you do. Well, then you've helped humanity once.